Hello, my name is Pastor Rick Dykem, and it's my privilege to welcome you to this online worship gathering of Ada Congregational Church. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, we pray that you would experience God's welcome here amidst a group of people doing our best to love all, welcome all, and seek justice for all. Today is the fourth week in our four-week series on our themes from Vacation Bible School. And today our theme is Love Cares. And so as we worship together, we pray that you would experience God's grace and God's peace. And I invite you to read together our responsive call to worship. Our loving God gathers us from the east and the west, from the north and the south. The Holy One is in our midst. Let us say so. We cried out to our God in the time of trouble and eased our distress. The Holy One is in our midst. God leads us on right paths. Our provider satisfies our thirst and meets our needs. The Holy One is in our midst. Consider God's steadfast love. Now I invite you to read this prayer together. Holy love, we worship you as your people. You tether us to you in righteousness and covenant. Reveal your face to us. Let us see you in our midst, in our neighbors, and in ourselves. Clothe us in love and compassion, and continually fashion us as your people, for you are our God. Amen. Welcome, friends. Let's say our greeting. Peace be with you and also with you. Today, we finish our treasure hunt series that is thinking about the parables that Jesus taught, stories of earthly things with a heavenly meaning, earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. Today, I've brought back our golden treasure box and wonder what pieces of a story may be inside. Ooh, this is unique. We have what says is the city of Jerusalem. That was a very big city and still is. And the city of Jericho. That makes me think that someone may be traveling from one city to another. Oh, this is different. There's a person with a rock. I wonder what that could be. Oh, and here. Hmm. It looks like maybe someone is helping someone around a rocky place. And there's a donkey. Interesting. Does it make you think of maybe a story, a parable that you've heard Jesus tell before? Well, today's story is the Good Samaritan. And I hope that as we hear the story read and we hear Pastor Rick share, that we are reminded of the last day theme that we had at VBS, and that is love cares. And our symbol for that day was a hand because there are so many good things we can do with our hands, with our words, walking places. We can be helpers in God's world and God's kingdom. I hope that this week you can be a helper. 
whether it's watering plants, walking a dog, saying kind words to someone, or simply growing stronger in the word of God as we read it together and pray. May it be that we are helpers, that we help to make the world a better place. Let us say our echo prayer together. Dear God, thank you for your love. Thank you for caring for us. Make us helpers in your world. Amen. And a special blessing for our friends. God made you. God loves you. God cares for you. Throughout the summer, we have been praying for ministry partners that our denomination partners with around the globe. The one for today is the UK. And since the person who wrote these prayers and these summaries of what they're doing, she's a teacher and she works with kids. And so it fits here well with our children's message time. So kids and friends of all ages, hear these stories and words from Aaron Miller, who is currently appointed to serve at St. Swithin's School in England. She partners with the Church of Christ uh, United Church of Christ, and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Her mission stewardship moment, she writes, some of my favorite experiences from my time at St. Swithin's have been bonding with the students, as well as sharing new experiences with them. Some of these moments are things like watching them see snow or the ocean for the first time. Others will be permanently ingrained in my memories like taking girls to run around in a river for the first time and having to say things I never thought would come out of my mouth, such as quit picking up the fish with a spoon <laughs> or yes, that is definitely what a leech looks like. I'm so grateful to have these special moments with my students and to be able to encourage them to live life to the fullest and more like Christ every day. If there's one thing that COVID has shown us, she writes, it's that nothing is certain, so we should never put off the chance to do good things, even if they scare us. In education, we can start teaching young people to use their gifts right now instead of waiting until someone else deems them old enough or good enough. This is the message I try to teach by example to my students, she writes, and I couldn't do it without your generous support. And Aaron wrote a prayer that I'd love to share with all of us. Dear God, thank you for today and every day. In schools everywhere, summer is a time of transition and uncertainty. We would like to pray for the girls and the staff of St. Swithin's, that God will be with the ones going off into the world and continue to bless them in whatever comes next. For the new people entering our community, we pray that St. Swithin's will be a place where they come to grow and be nurtured in Christ. As with many other countries right now, the cost of living in the UK is rising rapidly. We pray for the ones who have been most affected by this and who will be affected in the future. We pray that even though, even through this hardship, St. Swithin's will continue to thrive and be a haven for girls to learn to love one another and to love God. Amen. Friends, that's our prayer for us too, that we would learn to love one another and that we would love God. Smile.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 10, and it's another parable from Jesus. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The man answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Let's join together in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for these words of Scripture. We pray that they might comfort us and challenge us and point us to Jesus, the very Word of God. Amen. Earlier this month, we did vacation Bible school with a whole bunch of kids from church and from the community. The theme for that was treasure hunt, from the verse, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then we examined four parables from Jesus. The first was the parable of the sower and the seed with the theme, love grows. And the next was the parable of the wise and foolish builders, love builds. Last week, the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son, love forgives. And now today we reach the culmination of our series with love cares. And this parable is another one that is quite familiar to many. Simple enough, in theory, on a first read, you see that uh, a man is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he gets mugged, robbed, and the thieves take everything he has and leave him for dead. A couple of different passerbys, they just continue by, they don't help. And then one person does cares for him, gets him to an inn, pays for his needs, and moves on. A simple enough story in theory. But in the context, the way Jesus frames it, who these characters are, there is so much to explore. We could talk about this for weeks, but we're only going to talk about it for about 10 minutes. So here we go. It starts with a familiar beginning to Jesus' parables, Someone asks Jesus a question. It says, just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. So right away, Luke, from the start, is framing this. Jesus isn't just telling a story for no reason out of randomness. This is coming for a purpose. Somebody who knows a lot stands up to test Jesus. And he asks this question, what's the most important thing in life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus is asked 183 questions in the Gospels. I researched this this week. And Jared Bias, 
in his book, Love Matters More, tells us Jesus is asked 183 questions. Jesus asks 307 questions. And when Jesus is asked those 183, he directly answers, take a guess. How many do you think out of 183 questions that Jesus is asked in scripture, how many do you think he responds directly with an answer? A half? 90? A quarter? 45 to 50? No, it's three. Jesus directly answers three out of 183 questions. Fascinating. And Jared Bias in that book says, it's almost as if Jesus wasn't interested in giving us answers as much as he was in us growing into people who can make nuanced decisions based on a wise reading of the circumstances. It's almost as if, Jared Bias says, Jesus isn't interested in giving us the answers. Fascinating, because so many of us come to the text, so many of us come to religion for the answers. And yet Jesus gives three and asks 307. So a lawyer stands up and says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And the lawyer responds as any good Jew should. He says, Shema Yisraeli, Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. He says the Shema, the ancient Jewish creed at the foundation of their faith and practice. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you've given the right answer. Do this and you shall live. Remember, the lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Jesus has already flipped the script, turned it around and said, what do you read? What do you think? Man gives his answer. Jesus says, yep, sounds good. And the man has a follow-up then because it says he wants to justify himself. Interesting. So he's defensive. He's the one who gave the answer. And wanting to justify himself, he says, and who is my neighbor? Again, asks a direct question. And Jesus' response to who is my neighbor is, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Wait, Jesus, we asked who is my neighbor? This is a simple question, maybe a complicated question, but just want a direct answer. Who's my neighbor? A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. You remember last week, the parables of the lost coin and the lost sheep and the lost son. By the time you get to the lost son parable, a man had two sons. Jesus just tells these stories as a way to communicate truth, to invite us to wrestle with our presuppositions, to invite us into the complications. I have a friend that often writes hashtag complicate the narrative to things that are nuanced. So many people in our world want to yell back and forth just pithy statements proclaiming they're right, I'm right, you're wrong, and back and forth. And my friend often says, complicate the narrative. I feel like that's what Jesus is doing here. And most of the time he talks, he's making things more complicated rather than more simple. I often pray, may it comfort us. May these words comfort us. We want to hear words that are good and soothe our soul, but we also need to be challenged. We need to be discomforted or made uncomfortable to challenge our affluence, our comfort, our reliance on ourselves. So a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he gets beat up. The thieves take his money. They leave him for dead. And then some religious people happen across his path. A priest was going down that road. Now there's so much we could talk about, about why are the priests coming here? What did they just finish doing? There's 
There's so much, but we just have to leave it as there's some religious folks and they cross to the other side of the road. Now, when you hear that, you might think 131 going, you know, straight through downtown and it's eight lanes of traffic. No, this is much more like a bike path or maybe even a footpath at times, this road. In order to go to the other side, they were basically stepping over him, potentially. It's not that they missed that he was there. They intentionally, for a variety of reasons, and we don't have time to explore them all, they avoided this man and his bloodiness and his pain. And then a a third man comes by and, and Jesus says, a Samaritan man. Now that doesn't mean much for us because for us, good Samaritans are good people, right? If someone stops and helps you when you're on the side of the road with a flat tire, we call that person a good Samaritan. That's from this story. But, but in Jesus' day, talking with Jews, people who lived in Jerusalem, the idea of a good Samaritan was unthinkable. They hated the Samaritans. If they walked from Galilee up north down to Jerusalem in the south, they almost never went through Samaria, which was in the middle. This is currently the West Bank. Think of how people think of each other now in Israel and the West Bank. This is similar. They would walk out of their way to go around Samaria because they hated each other. We don't have time to get at all the reasons. But Jesus says, a Samaritan man came by. And you can imagine the crowd going, oh, groaning or spitting at the ground, like at the very thought of, oh no, now there's a Samaritan? What's he going to do to this poor guy on the side of the road? But Jesus, again, flips the story on its head. And the Samaritan, the hated one, the other, the person who's pushed aside, the person who isn't welcome in the temple, who isn't included in their religion, who they thought God didn't love, who they had held at an arm length, length, the Samaritans. This man kneels down and helps the person who was robbed. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine on them. He helps this man heal. He puts that man on his own donkey and rides him down to Jericho pays for him to go to an inn. He cares for this man. Now, Jesus says at the end of the story to the lawyer who is testing him, which of these three was a neighbor to this man? And the answer is clearly the Samaritan, but it's worth noting the lawyer doesn't say the Samaritan? Is it because he can't even bring himself to say that the Samaritan is a neighbor? Is it because he can't bring himself to say the word Samaritan along with something good? We don't know. But he says, the one who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus says, go and do likewise. Remember, this whole thing is about a test of Jesus. And Jesus flips the whole thing on this man who thought he knew a whole bunch, who thought he was real smart, tries to test Jesus and all of a sudden has to grapple with his presuppositions about the world and who is good and who is God and how do we relate to our neighbors. And Jesus does that for us too, if we're willing to take the time to challenge our presuppositions. So I invite us, I invite myself, I invite you, I invite us as a church family and community, who is our neighbor? And stepping back from that question, who have we othered? Who has our society othered and kept at an arm's length? Who are the groups of people that when someone says that, that someone in a group might go, oh, can't stand that group of people. I can't stand. They make me sick. They can't come to our church. They can't be part of our family. Our kids can't date their kids. Think of in our recent past, who are those groups of people? Imagine Jesus 
telling this story today? Who might the third person be? I leave you to fill in the blank for you and for us. But the one who is the neighbor is the one who shows mercy to the person who is hurting. There's a person who needs help. And the one who showed mercy was a neighbor, was showed love, showed care, showed that they love God with their whole heart and soul and mind and strength and loved their neighbor as their self. Who is my neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Who needs our help? Which groups of people really need someone, not necessarily to speak for them, but to lift them up so they might have room to use their own voice? Which groups of people need those of us with privilege to maybe take a step back so that they can get a little closer to the center? Which individuals in your life need a neighbor? the one who showed him mercy. Go and do likewise, Jesus says. Love cares. Amen. join together in prayer. Holy and gracious God, there is so much beauty in the world. We pray that we might pause long enough to see it, to taste it, to smell it, to touch it, to be near it, to make more of it. There is so much love in the world, may we experience it and may we share it. But God, there's also so much hurt and pain and sorrow in the world. And when we experience it, God, we pray that you might be with us. And when others are in the thick of it, we pray that we might be present with them, extending a hand extending a hug, sitting with them and listening, being present. 
God, we pray that we might be your hands and feet, that we might love well, and that the world might be changed through us, through your spirit working in and through us. God, we pray as this summer continues and as our church gets ready for the fall, as as our council and our trustees wrestle with what is our vision for the coming year, what things are most important, what are we going to focus most of our attention and our energy and our resources on, God, we pray that you would guide us. You would point us in your way that we might be followers of you not lifting ourselves up, not drawing attention to ourselves, but faithfully serving you and your work in the world. God, we pray that things might be made right as they're meant to be, even as we pray the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, even as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends, as you go, go in God's grace and God's peace. May you love God with everything that you have, your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And may you love your neighbor as yourself. Go in peace, friends.